Okay. So, well, hello and welcome everyone joining us today from various parts of the globe. I am very uh, happy to see you all here. Very happy to be part that you're part of this conversation. I am Dr. Pragya Shaube, India Coordinator to UNESCO Chair in Community-Based Research and Social Responsibility in Higher Education and co-founder of the Open Science Foundation Network. And I will be moderating, co-hosting and co-moderating the session today. So before we jump into the session, let me give a brief, like a very brief background. Uh, so at least once we all have been curious about the those ancestry genetic tests such as 23andMe. However, uh, not a lot of us would know that it is not as useful for a huge population because these tests are a function of a genomic population data in which only few populations are represented globally. To address this and to ensure that the biomedical conservation and other benefits of genomics research reach everyone, there have been lots of efforts to diversify the population data represented in genomic panels globally. And the government of India is actually also doing a lot of things in this regard. They are not very far behind. We have, uh, you know, we have been doing a lot of pioneering projects in genomics. And But however, as India stands at the forefront of genomic research with significant advancements uh, of biological data and its application, as the volume and the complexity of genomic data is growing, there is also at the same time, a pressing need to address the governance frameworks of this data that ensures ethical, equitable, and transparent management of this resource, and to ensure that the benefits are maximized without leaving any marginalized or underserved voices behind. So, take keeping all of this in mind, like what is happening in the Indian context currently, where we are growing and there is a niche gap in the data governance and how we should go about it. We are here to deliberate upon these issues, these very crucial issues. And hence we are organizing this panel discussion, which is advancing genomic data governance from an Indian perspective. Now this event is in partnership with Research Data Alliance, Open Science South Asia Network, UNESCO Chair in Community-Based Research and Social Responsibility in Higher Education, DST Center for Policy Research at the Indian Institute of Sciences, Transdisciplinary Research Cluster on Frugality Studies at Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. And we are really thankful to RDA Research Data Alliance for giving us this platform to speak uh, over here. And hence, I would like to invite Ms. Irina Hope and Ms. Connie Clear to discuss more about RDA. Uh, please take the floor. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Um, before I share slides, actually, I just wondered, I do see some familiar faces here in the audience, which is great to see, but would you be able to just raise a virtual hand or show me on screen if you actually don't know anything about the Research Data Alliance or very little? Okay, that's good. Okay, that, that helps. It just helps to know um, whether or not anybody in the audience has already you know, checked the RDA out or what you, what you know before we begin. I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully you can all see that now. I'll just make sure that I can see people on the other side. Okay, let me know if you can't hear me or see the screen at all. Um, but as I say, thank you very much for the invitation to speak today uh, and to be here at this wonderful event. And it's great to see so many people already online. Um, so what we would like to do is give you um, a bit of an introduction to the Research Data Alliance. For those of you who don't know anything about it, I hope this will help. Um, and before we do, I just wanted to also introduce myself. So uh, my name is Connie Clare, when it works, thank you. Yeah, my name is Connie Clare, and I'm the Community Development Manager at the Research Data Alliance Foundation. Um, my role is to really support the global volunteer community at the RDA and its community groups and to help towards the harmonization of efforts. And with me on this call today is my colleague, Irina Hope. So Irina, I don't know if you want to just introduce yourself. Absolutely. Thank you, Konya. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Thank you very much for joining. And um, I manage the whole cycle of plenary planning here at the Research Data Alliance and I also manage smaller events and webinars, whether they're virtual, hybrid, or in-person. 
I have been involved in organizing plenary meetings since the pandemic. So a lot have changed since, and we've gone through different challenges. And it is our pleasure with Connie to present a little bit about the RD and give you an introduction about our organization. Thank you. Thank you, Irina. Um, just before we get into the presentation as well, Irina is going to post a few quick links in the chat for you. Um, so we do have a link to our web platform, the page about the RDA, which gives you a bit more information about our organisation and community. But also there is a document called RDA for Newcomers, which will go through all of the basics um, and some of which I will present and Irina and I will present today. Um, and the third link that you'll see in the chat is actually an invitation for you to join our organisation. So it's very simple and it's free and easy. Um, for, for you to do that, it's open to all members. So anybody who's interested in anything related to data sharing and reuse can join the Research Data Alliance. In the next 10 minutes or so, so probably not that long, um, I'd like to give you an introduction to what we are uh, as a community and an organization. I'll share with you the different types of community groups that we have. So these community groups are set up by the volunteer community. And then I'll share also the different types of membership that we have at the Research Data Alliance. And then Arena will talk a bit more about our plenary meetings that happen twice a year that bring our global network together to talk about various different topics and issues. So really the Research Data Alliance community is based on our vision, our mission, and our guiding principles. So our overarching vision is to, to provide a global neutral platform to bring various different stakeholders, so researchers and innovators together to openly share and reuse data across these various different boundaries. So we have technological boundaries, we have uh, disciplinary boundaries and also regional boundaries. And the idea is that we want to tackle different data sharing issues to tackle uh, grand societal challenges. And the mission of the RDA is to provide this platform to build the social and technical um, bridges that enable data sharing and reuse. And we do have at the heart of everything we do, six of our guiding principles. I won't go into detail. You can read more about them on the website, but these are openness, consensus based. We're inclusive. We want to harmonize our efforts as much as possible. So not reinventing the wheel. We are community driven and we are non-profit and technology neutral, which means we don't promote, sell or endorse commercial products. So in a nutshell about the Research Data Alliance, as I've just said, we are global, we're consensus based, we're community driven. Um, the network actually comprises more than 14,000 data experts uh, from around the world. We're also supported by more than 80 organizational and affiliate members. 35 different regional networks and collectively this spans more than 150 countries so as you can imagine it is quite a global and culturally diverse community that we have and the work of the research data alliance is achieved by these community groups um, we have more than 100 different i would say active in some form um, of community groups working on various different topics and these uh, volunteer members they join the, or set up these community groups and they are responsible for creating these flagship recommendations and outputs which are openly available for adoption and reuse by anyone anywhere in the world that has the capacity to do so so at the heart of the research data alliance as i've just mentioned are our community groups so these are set up for the community by the community so it's very much an organic bottom-up process and, and as I mentioned they're working on various different data management and data related topics. So the first type of group we have is an RDA working group. So typically an RDA working group has a finite lifespan of around 12 to 18 months and the expectation is that they will develop and create some kind of concrete deliverable for the community. So this could be development of tools, it could be the creation of new policy, it could be guidelines or, or recommendations on best practices or a new product product that can be used by the data community and implemented in different contexts. The next type of group we have is an interest group. So these are slightly broader in scope than a working group. 
it doesn't have a definite lifespan. So an interest group can be active for as long as the topic is of interest to the community. And as I said, these are slightly broader in scope. So they're not expected to actually create any recommendations or outputs, although interest groups can create outputs if they want to. But it's more focused on solving a high level data sharing problem. And then from an interest group, working groups can emerge to tackle specific um, problems and create solutions. And then the third type of group we have is a community of practice. And these are um, the most new type, really, that we have. So these were established in 2020. They have a more domain or disciplinary focus. So it's higher level than an interest group again. And the idea of a community of practice is that they are more of a coordination focus group. They are what we call an umbrella group. So they actually are a linking pin linking various working groups and interest groups within a discipline together, internally within the RDA, but also making connections with external organisations within the discipline. And similar to an interest group, a community of practice can really um, last as long as the community is active in the area. And we currently have one community of practice called Improving Global Agricultural Data. So this word cloud shows the different types of groups we have. As I mentioned, we've got more than 100 different types of group working on different open science and research data management topics. So some of these are domain agnostic, working on things like metadata standards, for example, or persistent identifiers or repository infrastructure. Um, and then we also have groups that are more disciplinary. So we have groups that are actually focused more on genomics or omics technologies um, and health and medical data. We have groups that are also focused on social sciences um, and the humanities, but also um, on climate change and environmental data. So really there is something um, for, for, for everybody or at least everybody um, at the RDA. So here is the different uh, types of membership and how you can get involved. And I think the first type of membership is possibly the most appealing to people here um, as individual members. So as I mentioned, anybody can join the Research Data Alliance. It's free and open to anybody. And this will give you access to the areas of the web platform. You'll also get a newsletter to keep you up to date with uh, Research Data Alliance developments. You can join the groups, any group that you're interested in and contribute to the discussions as well as the creation and the adoption of recommendations and outputs. And I think the important part here is that you will get access to an international community of data experts. So you'll be able to get involved um, in the various different meetings, the events, the webinars, and hopefully learn new things and be able to boost your own personal and professional development. The next type of membership we have is organizational and affiliate membership. So we have more than 80 different organizational and affiliate members. And this is really of mutual benefit. So the idea is that organizations join, they become a member of the organizational assembly, which meets on a monthly basis, and they can bring their organizational perspective to the Research Data Alliance. Um, and they can share experiences and best practices and be able to take back information as well as recommendations and outputs and implement them within their own institutional context. So the idea is that organisations can become early adopters of some of the RDA work, um, but also gain support. And the final type of membership we have currently are our regional memberships. So we have more than 35 different uh, regional networks. And similar to an organisational membership, the idea here is, as we are a global forum, that regions and nations can bring their own perspective and, and obviously different culturally diverse perspectives to an international forum. So we have a regional assembly that meets on a regular basis. Um, and again, the idea is that they can bring their geographical challenges to the Research Data Alliance and hopefully uh, be able to share experiences and best practices and take them back. Um, and we realise that research data management and open science challenges actually cross borders. So um, it's something that most places are, most regions are facing challenges. And so we feel that we have a lot of strength in being global. Irina, over to you for the plenaries. Thank you, Connie. So what are the plenary meetings? The RD is a very large <clears throat> energetic community, and it includes many individuals, organizations, and groups. And plenaries are the places that unites our global community. We call these events plenaries. 
So during these meetings, RD groups, new and old members meet together to share progress of their researches, projects, and outputs. After the pandemic, uh, the plenaries are now hosted virtually and in a hybrid format. And by doing that, we make them available to everyone. And here are the facts. Over the past 11 years of the RDA, we have hosted 22 plenaries um, covering five countries, five continents, and 14 different countries. We have approximately five to 700 data enthusiasts joining plenaries, and we are growing. And 2024 is a year when we focus on expanding our horizons further. We are focusing on expanding the community within the Southern Hemisphere. Plenaries are hugely supported by um, those who are not in the position to join our meetings. And therefore, the RDA supports early career researchers, students, and those members from low and income, middle income countries. And we do it by reducing our registration fees. And of course, in the heart of the plenaries are working and interest groups and also birds or feather meetings. There is definitely a lot to discover. And the next slide, please. 2024 is already a busy year for the RJ community. And many of you know that today is our fifth day of the 22nd plenary, which is currently running virtually, accommodating all time zones. And the focus of this particular plenary is on our communities and the region members. We have almost 500 virtual attendees registered and around 20% of them are completely new individuals to the RDA. So plenaries are not only for the current members, they are open to everyone. And the plan for the second plenary of 2024 is ongoing and P23 is going to be hosted at the University of Costa Rica in San Jose in November this year and also online. 24th plenary is still a subject to further planning and we are currently working on identifying details. However, P25 can be marked in your calendars and is going to be taking place in Brisbane, Australia as a part of International Data Week. This is going to be a fifth edition of IDW, where three member organizations such as RDA, International Science Councils Committee Data or Core Data and World Data System WDS are organizing it with collaboration from the local Australian Research Data Commons. So please do join us for the future plenaries and thank you. Thank you, Irina. So on that note, I'll leave you with this slide. Our slides will be available with our contact details um, on them. Um, and so if you have any further questions, please feel free to reach out to us. We'd be more than happy to help. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Connie. And thank you, Irina, for giving that introduction of RDA. And I think a lot of people will be interested in learning more about you. So please, uh, check out the website and yes now i mean before we proceed on to the main event there are a few housekeeping tools please keep yourselves on mute at all times and if you have any questions for the panelists please use the chat uh, feature and we will be taking up your questions at the end or perhaps even during the conversation because we wanted to be as open as exploratory as we can so yes and uh, with this, I think we are ready to move on to the next segment, uh, which is basically the panel discussion itself. And for that, I would like to invite uh, my co-host and my uh, co-organizer and my partner, Dr. Momita Kole. Uh, Momita, please, floor is yours. Yeah, thanks, Prakra. And so, hello again, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Momita Kode. I'm a science, technology, and policy researcher at uh, Department of Science and Technology Center for Policy Research at Indian Institute of Science. And I also is a policy consultant with International Science Council. Uh, 
as Pragya already has mentioned, I'm also a co-founder of the Open Science South Asia Network. Now, uh, coming to the today's panel, uh, the primary objective of this panel discussion is to examine and discuss the multifaceted aspects of biological and genomics data governance in India, focusing on the key areas such as indigenous data rights, FAIR, that is findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, and CARE, this consent, access, respect, ethics, these two principles. On also on regulatory ecosystem and strategies for managing data in silos effectively. Additionally, the transformative role of artificial intelligence in advancing genomic research and its implications for data governance and ethical decision making in this scenario would also be further discussed. Uh, of course, without taking much time in introducing the panel, I will now move forward to our panelist, I will introduce the panelists and then uh, each panelist and then hand it over to them. And then I will call the next one. So uh, our first panelist today is uh, Professor Partha Majumdar. He's a National Science Chair at the Science and Engineering Board of Government of India and a distinguished professor at the John C. Martin Center for Liver Research and Innovation, Kolkata, and an Emeritus Professor of the Indian Statistical Institute. Renowned for his pioneering work in human statistical and population genetics and genomics, Professor Majumdar has developed significant methodologies, mapped genes for health-related traits, and provided critical insights into genomic variability in immune response to vaccine. A fellow of India's Na National Science Academies and TWAs, he founded the National Institute of uh, Biomedical Genomics. Professor Majumdar's leadership extend to global consortia, including the Human Cell Atlas and the International Common Disease Alliance, while his expertise benefits the World Health Organization as well. He has played a pivotal role in genomic research policy nationally and internationally. He has been honored with, honored with prestigious award, including the GN Ramchandran Gold Medal in 2021 and TWS Prize in Biology in 2009. I won't take much more time in introduction. And Professor Majumdar, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, Mamita. Thank you very much, Pragya. Also, um, uh, let me express my gratitude to both Irina and uh, Hani for um, co-hosting, collaborating with, uh, um, you know, Pragya and Mamita in order to host this uh, entire event. Uh, I have been given uh, essentially three tasks, uh, three bullet points, and I will discuss them one after another. I'll mention what those bullet points are. The first bullet point was to asking me to provide an overview of the prominent genomics projects in India. And there are uh, several prominent genomics projects that are currently ongoing. But all of these uh, genomics projects that I shall describe to you uh, they have uh, like four fathers. There have been uh, smaller projects, medium term, medium pro medium um, uh, projects, and large projects that have preceded uh, the major projects that are being undertaken now. Uh, most of the genomics projects in India that are of uh, you know large uh, in in terms of sample size, in terms of depth, and so on, are primarily uh, population genomics project. And by the way. Uh, when I talk about genomics projects, I'm only going to talk about, or when I talk about genomics, I'm primarily going to, or uh, exclusively going to talk about humans. Uh, there are, of course, uh, there have been, and there are major genomics projects in the area of uh, plants and microbes that I'm not aware of uh, uh, at any uh, significant depth, and therefore I will not, not even touch upon those. So I'm going to essentially describe to you the major ongoing projects in the area of humans. And like I was saying that in the area of humans, the uh, projects are uh, primarily in the area of population genetics or population genomics, which essentially means that given the kind of diversity that we have in physical characteristics, in cultural traits, in, uh, and culture includes language, uh, given what we understand of our, um, you know, um, peopling of this, a particular subcontinent from various kinds of domains of science, 
Um, there is an enormous amount of interest uh, in uh, of two kinds. One is to quantify the extent of diversity among the people of India. And secondly, to address the question, where do we come from? And uh, essentially, the, the projects that are currently being, the large projects that are currently being undertaken um, have uh, are trying to address these uh, issues. Uh, in addition, correlated with these issues or associated with these issues is the issue of the uh, extent of diversity that we see in various kinds of phenotypes physical traits, diseases, and so on and so forth. So much of it is related to the genes of these individuals, but some of it is also related to the environment uh, where, they, where they reside or where they belong. The uh, largest project that's going on right now is called the Genome India Project. The Genome India Project essentially is trying to quantify uh, diversity among the various endogamous populations of India, at a national level, and uh, the intent is to uh, is to sequence um, ten thousand genomes um, of, of uh, um, various kinds of uh, endogamous populations of India, and uh, uh, they they are reaching their target. They are almost there. They are reaching their target. But like I said, that uh, we need to talk about uh, preceding projects, and one of the uh, major projects that started. And again, these are these have evolved to larger and larger projects. The project that evolved in the early 2000s was the was called the Indian Cancer Genome um, or Indian Genome Variation Consortium. This was a consortium of uh, seven institutions of India, uh, mostly uh, belonging to the Center uh, Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, um, and uh, it was spearheaded by uh, the Institute of Genomics and Integrative Biology. Uh, at that time, and uh, uh, again, this was uh, at for the for the time that this project was undertaken. It was a large project, but of course, uh, it was it was succeeded by even larger projects. The second project that was undertaken again in order to understand population uh, diversity, uh, migrations, etc., was called the Pan Asia project. And here, it was not just the the focus was not just India. India included, of course, India major played a major uh, role, but also included various other countries of Asia because, again, population movements have not only been within India, but also from outside of India. And these kinds of admixtures, etc., also have um, uh, a, a strong, uh, a, a strong uh, relationship with the nature of um, diseases, or the nature of um, uh, our, our ability to fight off diseases or ward off infections, etc. The third project that was undertaken was called the Genome Asia Project that was undertaken and uh, sort of completed in about uh, uh, about uh, five years ago um, called the Genome Asia Project where a large number of um, uh, individuals from India uh, were sequenced. And like I said, that these, um, these uh, projects have evolved over a period of time. It started at uh, by looking at, uh, you know, specific um, polymorphic specific points on the human genome where individuals vary to sequencing the human genome to discover new variants and so on and so forth. So the Genome Asia pro project, for example, was a combination of whole genome sequencing and its own sequencing um, that led to great insights into the extent of diversity uh, and and uh, uh, extent of ad estimates of the extent of admixture and also uh, taught us how um, the uh, these these genomes or genomic diversity um, feed on to our understanding of the prevalence of various kinds of complex diseases. Like I said, the Genome India project is right now one of the largest uh, projects that's um, that's undergo ongoing in India. Uh, it's involving uh, ten thousand individuals and um, whole genome sequencing of ten thousand individuals. These individuals being drawn from various parts of India, from um, a large number of uh, endogamous groups that are present in India uh, across linguistic, um, you know, affinities across uh, cultural affinities and so on. <clears throat> so, the whole idea of all of these projects is essentially to quantify diversity, to ask the question: Where do we come from? Where does this diversity um, emanate from? And how does this diversity play um, or help explain the um, physical characteristics, including 
disease prevalences among various uh, populations of India. So uh, th this, this was one major project. The second major project uh, uh, that's being currently undertaken um, is a project that uh, has to do with breast cancer. And this is a multi-omics project, meaning it has genomics, epigenomics, uh, and so on. Um, multi-omics project of uh, Indian, Indian breast cancer um, uh, patients. And this is being spearheaded by the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research. By the way, the Genome India project is being spearheaded or funded by the Department of Biotechnology. Uh, the India Breast Cancer Genome Atlas, as it is called, this new project, as it is called, uh, is being um, funded and spearheaded by the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research. This was uh, preceded by uh, one uh, really massive project uh, that was um, supported by the Department of Biotechnology, which was a part of an international consortium called the International Cancer Genome Consortium, uh, <clears throat> essentially trying to understand the genomic basis of cancer or uh, genomic drivers of various kinds of cancers. Now, the, the International Cancer Genome uh, Consortium dealt with uh, 22 different types of cancers. Uh, the total number of um, genomes that were sequenced or um, uh, interrogated was, uh, of, well, the target was 25,000. The target was almost met, fell short by 800. So 24,289 is the total number of individuals cancer patients who have been interrogated using genomics, and India played a major role there. India contributed to the International Cancer Genome Consortium um, by uh, looking at uh, oral cancer patients uh, in India and uh, the sample size of the oral cancer patients uh, of the pool of oral cancer patients was 500 patients. Uh, we looked at uh, whole genome sequences. We looked at whole exome sequences. So a combination of these two provided us now with a clear notion of the genomic dark drivers or genomic uh, uh, those genomic uh, uh, variants that actually drives uh, oral cancer in India. The um, uh, um, India Breast Cancer Genome Atlas Project has already collected some data and the data are, are being analyzed and uh, these results will become available shortly. Uh, there is also, the CSIR is also spearheading what's called a Phenome India project. Phenome, of course, uh, does not necessarily mean that it is genomics, but genomics is a major component of this Phenome India project, which is essentially looking at uh, all of the um, CSIR, not all, a large uh, fraction of CSIR employees at various levels and various sexes, um, uh, looking at their health traits and uh, also genomics is a is an integral component of that uh, of that project. Uh, most recently, um, the Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology, in uh, in collaboration with the University of Bristol, has uh, come has has been funded for um, uh, funded for a project that will explore uh, key population health questions using data sets from across Asia, Africa, North and South American continents. Uh, so this has been. Um, funded by, uh, I think, the um, uh, uh, London School of Hygiene and Public Health, but I'm not 100%. Well, I think it's been funded by the Medical Research Council of the UK. Um, so given uh, these kinds of data that are being generated, it was imperative that the data be housed in a place which is accessible. And so um, the government of India, the Department of Biotechnology, they have uh, the, the Department of Biotechnology actually spearheaded the discussion and spearheaded the effort. The effort has culminated in the formation of an Indian biological data center uh, that's physically located in North India near Delhi. And uh, this is an, um, the whole purpose of this particular uh, data center um, is to uh, be a repository of all of the do uh, all of the data uh, and not just, not just a repository, but also an annotated rep repository of the data and make sharing of these data um, easy uh, among among researchers who actually want to uh, do further research with the data that are uh, that are um, placed in this uh, large data repository. Uh, so es essentially, the um, uh, the data center is mandated to archive all publicly funded science data generated at the national level. Um, not an easy task at all because uh, you know the the different kinds of data sets are at different. Uh, levels of complexity are of different structures and so on. So all of this is happening right now as we speak. Um, it's not uh, um, not like one of the most efficient ways 
uh, of uh, accessing data, but again, the efficiency is becoming, is increasing by the day. There are all, I'm told that there are already over 280,000 submissions uh, in the, in the uh, in, uh, Indian Biological Data Center, and we hope that the ability, our ability to access these data will become uh, even more and more easy as time goes by, as uh, the data center organizes itself, both in terms of hardware as also in terms of uh, software. So that's, that was my uh, first task, to give you an overview of um, the uh, nature of the genomics projects. And like I said, that this is not all of genomics. This is uh, genomics uh, as, as it relates to the humans. Um, and, and I've only described the large projects. Uh, the second uh, task that's been given to me is the assessment of the impact of genomics research and its implication on the Indian population. Uh, and and uh, sort of also touch upon um, ethics and uh, you know how it's uh, benefiting um, the uh, benefiting humankind in India and also what may be a foreseeable misuse of these uh, data that might eventually lead to marginalization of these communities. Now, in terms of assessment of the impact of genomics, as we have seen um, very recently during the COVID, um, um, that. Uh, you know, the, the, most everybody knew what, uh, what was being tested, what genomic sequencing was all about. I wouldn't say that this is the result of all of the big projects that Government of India had undertaken, but all that I'm trying to say is that there is an appreciation of genomics, how genomics can actually impact on human health, how it can benefit human health, and aside from health, how it can actually help integrate societies by understanding what the relationships among the various endogamous groups are, unless there is a clear understanding of, uh, of how we how these groups relate to each other, there is no appreciation of our deep relationship, um, uh, deep at the uh, the uh, in in terms of time that we have actually common ancestors from uh, from whom uh, we have evolved. If that appreciation is not there, then given the kind of uh, diversity that we see, the diversity actually might actually uh, fuel. Um, uh, tensions uh, amongst us and this understanding, the genomic understanding that there is a unity uh, in spite of all of these diversity um, is something that's uh, uh, absolutely uh, essential to um, understand and to celebrate. So I think that uh, you know the impact of genomics is not so easy to assess, but again, um, what we must stress, uh, we as um, you know, in, uh, human geneticists who have been doing research, um, many of you who are actually formulating policy, uh, providing uh, outreach to the various co kinds of communities, uh, it's uh, the re joint responsibility of all of us to actually percolate what might be the benefits of understanding, genetic understanding of relationships among populations uh, and at the individual level on our, uh, on our own health. Um, this needs to be uh, percolated. And again, this is... Uh, function of the level of education that people have. And as we know, that even though the level of education has been increasing, it's not at its uh, peak. And we certainly need to, um, you know, uh, explain these various kinds of things in appropriate ways so, so that even the less educated people can understand the impact of genomics and uh, what uh, genomics might entail. In terms of ethical uses, I think the eth most ethical use uh, is to be able to use uh, the data, the, use the information that we generate without actually, uh, um, uh, you know, divulging uh, various kinds of um, uh, privacy uh, issues. So again, um, you know, given the genomes, given the genomes of individuals tagged to various um, uh, other attributes of our own selves, we can actually point out who this uh, uh, who this data belong to, even if the name is obliterated. So one needs to be very very uh, cautious um, because the genomics data can be used for uh, good purposes, can also be used to um, marginalize people. So one needs to be very careful about how one generates, stores, shares data, and all of these are actually being uh, well have been have actually been discussed in the context of the Indian Biological Data Center. And every day we uh, face new challenges about uh, various kinds of ethical issues that arise, and therefore these discussions go on. Today, of course, um, uh, the major discussion is about ethical uh, use of artificial intelligence in the analysis of all of these data. But again, I'm not going to touch upon it because there are other people who are uh, 
um, um, who are supposed to uh, speak about these. In terms of marginalization, I still would uh, say that it is possible to use genomics data to ostracize, to marginalize populations. But at least uh, during my lifetime of uh, you know many years of many decades of research on uh, genomics, I have not seen uh, this happen in India, although I have witnessed some of these data being used to ostracize populations in other parts of the world, and I will not, not name the other parts of the world. I have not seen that um, kind of marginalization or ostracization of populations within India. Um, so uh, I think the most uh, useful use of or ethical use of genomic data uh, is the betterment, is the strengthening of relationships among population groups and the use of these data for betterment of human health. Um, the last point uh, that has been asked of me is who owns the genomics data and the regulatory gaps that are there in the current system? Um, honestly, the genomics data, um, you know, without being tagged to uh, the individual who has uh, actually donated the sample from whom the data ha have been generated, um, this belongs to essentially, uh, it's global. Uh, that, that's my view, that uh, the data, unless it's tracked down to the individual and used for negative purposes, it's essentially data, uh, data that are, that's global. Because if we look, look at evolution, um, we have a common, common ancestor and we've all evolved from that common ancestor. So uh, all our roots go back to that common ancestor and therefore um, the diversity that we see is a, a result of uh, time is a result of passage of time and, and is a result of admixture and globalization of our genomes in some ways. And therefore, uh, the genomes that, uh, that be, uh, don't really belong to each one of us, it belongs to some uh, global community because we have all evolved from a common ancestor. So this is a philosophical point of view, but there are, uh, like uh, Pragya said, that there are um, companies that are actually trying to make use of these data for um, commercial purposes to make predictions for uh, diagnost, uh, diagnostics of diseases um, and, and also you know, for, um, for predicting your uh, future, so to say. So there are commercial uses that are being made and when commercial uses are being made, then we must take the view that the genome of the individual belongs to the individual. Um, and, and therefore you can't make illegitimate commercial use of that particular genome. Uh, there are uh, certainly gaps in regulatory uh, in, in the regulatory framework, but these gaps over a period of time have actually been um, uh, been uh, sort of put a closure on. I wouldn't say 100% closure, but they are coming together. The gaps are being narrowed, and uh, therefore, I, I think uh, you know over a period of time, as we understand the nuances of genomic data, as we understand the uh, the, the way that genomic data can be used in order to um, uh, in order, to, in both positive and negative ways, uh, this understanding is enabling us to uh, formulate uh, the regulatory frameworks in such a way that uh, they are they are helpful to humankind. They are helpful to the individuals uh, in society, uh, as opposed to they are being used in um, negative ways. So I will stop there, and uh, I think I've spoken uh, my bit. I'm happy to. I'll stand by. Happy to take any questions at any point of time. Uh, but this is what my take on genomics is, and I'm very, very positive uh, about the fact that uh, we, lots and lots of people and more and more young people are actually pursuing genomics, um, uh, and, and, uh, and therefore we would soon uh, be able to use genomic data in better and better ways for uh, human betterment, both at the personal level and at the society level. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Uh, thank you, Professor Machumdar, for providing such a nice overview and also, of course, setting the stage and also providing that how the genomics is can be used for, for good. We can always avoid the bad side of it. Uh, without further ado, now I will uh, invite our next speaker, uh, uh, Professor Pravan K. Uh, he is a distinguished professor and former dean at the School of Biotechnology, Javala. Nehru University, New Delhi. Professor Dhar holds a PhD in human genetics from Banaras Hindu University, Varanasi, UP. With over 30 years of extensive experience, Professor Dhar has led pioneering research groups across Japan, Singapore, and India, and developed a novel drug discovery platform recognized as potentially groundbreaking by the European Science Commission. 
He has significantly contributed to the field of synthetic biology, both nationally and internationally. So we are eager to hear Professor Dhar, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kohli. Um, very good afternoon uh, to everyone in the panel. Um, and thank you, Pragya, for having me uh, on this distinguished panel to discuss uh, the synthetic biology aspect of uh, uh, what is happening globally as well as in India. Um, so coming from the really the first principles of synthetic biology, I think it's very important to define what is synthetic biology because it's being mixed with other fields. Um, and so uh, sometimes it is very difficult to have a crisp definition and there have been many conferences just to define synthetic biology. And why is definition so important? Is because, um, you know, as they say, you cannot break the law if you do not know what is the law. So one needs to uh, stay within the boundary conditions of responsible innovation. Uh, the way uh, synthetic biology has been defined back in uh, June 2004, when the field was announced at MIT, was uh, basically the engineering approach to biology. So you have two ways of doing science. Either you do reductionism, so you see an organism and go straight to the components in the form of genes, RNA, proteins, and so on, uh, a, a very traditional reductionist approach. Um, the second way of doing science has been uh, integrating this data. So you have bioinformatics and systems biology coming in and creating virtual cells. The third approach that was started one and a half decades back was, uh, can we chemically synthesize genome? Can we chemically synthesize mitochondria, Golgi bodies, and so on? Now this uh, ground up synthesis of uh, biological components gave rise to an engineering flavor. And so um, in that context, um, I would like to say, uh, if you have to talk about a responsible innovation or responsible research in the synthetic biology space, one has to think of questions about the potential consequences of an innovation, both positive and negative, which are beyond the product. For example, how does it affect people? How does it affect the environment, economy, and so on? Before the product is released or before the services are released, uh, one also needs to know is uh, society in need of this innovation? Are, are we imposing something uh, from getting a scientific thrill out of this uh, activity? And uh, there also needs to be open communication between researchers and public. Uh, well, in the space of synthetic biology, a lot has been attempted. A lot of misunderstanding has been cleared. Unfortunately, synthetic biology got a bad press. And now people have this, many people have this feeling that um, we are trying to bring back the dinosaurs, the extinction of animals and so on. Uh, well, um, there are uh, several activities uh, that uh, have been pursued by the community. Uh, for example, now we have uh, six based DNA. Earlier we had four based DNA. Now we have a six based DNA. The six based DNA is functional. Uh, people are trying to design brand new microbes. Uh, we have the technology of a desktop DNA printer where you can print DNA of your choice. Uh, science has progressed so much that we can now install codes. For example, if you want to increase the biomanufacturing of some component, there are codes available um, that can be customized. Now, computing is coming in a big way AI is coming, already it's there. And now people are also talking about going beyond uh, uh, the traditional four bases, ATGC. Some scientists overseas are working on creating brand new DNA. They say this DNA is 3 billion years old and it's very old now. You need to reboot it with a new DNA. Well, uh, is this necessary? Or uh, is this uh, something that creates a thrill? Um, well, to address these, these are complex issues. Only dialogues can sort out uh, these uh, aspects. But what I feel is that there needs to be a biodiversity common, wherein you contribute 
your innovation. Um, you share what is uh, required uh, without, of course, uh, uh, disturbing the confidential agreements. Um, openness is very necessary. Do we have the regulatory framework, um, ethical guidelines, and oversight mechanisms? Um, well, in the biotech space, yes, uh, it's already there. But the way technology is growing fast, uh, I see the need of a lot more discussions and dialogues. Um, you know, regulations are like fences that keep innovation on the safe track. Um, ethical guidelines are like uh, signs that help uh, scientists to move in the right direction. And oversight mechanisms, I believe, are like referees to ensure everybody plays by the rules. Now, uh, these aspects are absolutely fine, but where are the rules and who's writing the rules? Uh, there are DNA writing uh, technologies that are available uh, in the synthetic biology space. DNA editing, now regulations are coming. Uh, already something is there at a very preliminary level. Um, one needs to have um, clarity on the high throughput um, strain engineering uh, platforms. Uh, cell-free systems are coming in a big way, uh, 3D cultures and so on. What I was trying to indicate is technology is moving quite fast and uh, regulations or, or shall I say um, effective governance. Uh, well, intellectually one can dissect the problem and uh, come up with the set of rules and uh, regulations. However, the toughest part is implementation. You can have harmonization, uh, not an issue. Intellectually, one can have harmonization, but uh, will people accept it? Will it be implemented? That has always been a big challenge. Uh, now, AI is coming in a big way to unlock the secrets hidden in our genome. Uh, likewise, AI is helping in designing new circuits uh, and also breakthroughs in personalized medicine, drug discovery, and so on. Issues like data privacy, um, let's say algorithmic bias uh, and the need for human expertise to be alongside the computer. That is always uh, going to be felt in the coming years. Um, well, uh, the other aspect that has been uh, asked to speak of um, is the policy requirement to address conflicts of interest or the potential misuse of the genomic data. Well, there are... Uh, uh, Convention of Biological Diversity, CBD, and Cartagena Protocol for Biosafety, and so many, um, you know, historically this has been discussed quite well. But uh, given the way technology is evolving, we are not just talking about the genomics, which are talking of uh, beyond genomics, because genomics has an impact on the cell and organism and so on. So one has to look at all the levels. Uh, tomorrow, if um, desktop DNA printers uh, become the norm, uh, it would be very easy to uh, print a virus of your choice. So uh, are we prepared with the regulatory uh, mechanisms? Um, I'm not sure of that, but people are sensitive to this. Yes, they have identified that. Um, currently, it's mostly a self-regulated community. However, um, somebody needs to take the first step and say that, Hey, this is coming up, and we also need to predict the way technology is coming up in future. It is not only reacting to that, but also predicting and being ready with uh, whatever is coming up in future. A lot of things done with good intent. However, um, you know, one has to be uh, clear that uh, this can have a double-edged sword. So um, policies uh, are needed that require uh, clear and informed consent before the data is collected, let's say from the genomics level. Uh, privacy is, is very important. Uh, there are um, issues of uh, whether individuals should have the right to access, rectify, or delete their own data if they don't want the data to be shared and so on. Uh, yes, there are um, a lot of discussions happening. Um, at the moment, uh, biotechnology overall is governed at several levels, starting from the Institution Biosafety Committee, and then you have other mechanisms in India. Um, however, uh, in my opinion, um, one needs to have uh, 
biological engineering as a part of uh, essential discussion of the future by the by the policymakers and including scientists and the public. So with that, I'd like to conclude and I'll be happy to address more queries. If you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Dhar, for uh, such an enlightening overview and also providing us that why we should discuss and possibly this is also one of the reasons why we are here today to kickstart such kind of discussion. It's ongoing. We want to also put some more inputs into the ongoing discussion. So now, of course, now uh, to our third speaker. Uh, our third speaker is Professor Sonajarya Min. She is Professor at School of Computer and System Science at Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. She has over 33 years of teaching experience with research interest in machine learning and artificial intelligence, a journey that started from a town in Jhakhat. Hailing from the Oran tribe, her culture background fuels her commitment to tribal issues, including land rights, development impacts, and education disparities. I will list a few examples of her work, uh, and trust me, the list is really long, but I will just tell a few words. Uh, as Vice Chancellor of Sidhu Kanthu Murmu University, Dumka Chakhan, she introduced MA in Santal Cultural Studies to propel research in tribal and indigenous culture by tribal scholars. She serves as a member of the Extract Committee of the Department of Science and Technology, Government of India, for science and technology innovation for livelihood enhancement of scheduled tribes in India. Today, she will be sharing her expertise in uh, AI and machine learning technologies, their advent in biological science, and how the indigenous voice can be preserved in this technological era. So, Professor Mintz, over to you. Thank you very much uh, for uh, having me uh, as a, uh, on the panel with a very esteemed uh, co-panelists. And it's wonderful to see my colleague, uh, Prasad Har, uh, at this platform where we, we don't get to meet uh, each other so much in the, on the campus and the heat is keeping us to our labs. I think that's one explanation. However, um, I'm extremely uh, grateful that uh, no, uh, I've been included in this uh, panel of today's uh, event and session uh, uh, deliberating on such an important um, topic uh as and also um it was uh, so thank you pragya and momita and also for connie and uh, arena for giving us the landscape of other things besides what we in our small world keep doing um and now as it was mentioned um uh, that you know my research area does fall very much under ai and machine learning and that i have been doing now for over 30 years and have seen the landscape of AI research also change. At times it went down the curve and we thought because I myself did my PhD in 80s, beginning in 80s and then concluded in early 90s in AI. However, um, I thought it was a topic which was just for that era, but it has had its own comeback and such a surge with data science uh, coming up and with explosion, of course, of uh, da data and da da the ways to do uh, digital accumulation of data or digitization of data. And so um, AI has had its comeback and we all see it, feel at times the onslaught, if I may use that word, because I think uh, uh, one is... Uh, the, one thinks it is out of control. But a couple of things I'd like to bring from the perspective of data and AI techniques is that, you see, uh, even before, while at the early in the 80s when computer and computer science was being taught, one would talk about you know, garbage in and garbage out. Now the same prevails whenever AI techniques or machine learning technique is applied to any sort of data. So having said that, the, the of the um, uh, concerns or some of the bullets that were flagged to me to also take up during this deliberation, I've got uh, some 12 minutes left, was that how does underrepresentation and bias, biasness influence 
AI te uh, techniques. Uh, if I was going to uh, flash a slide, I wanted to uh, bring this picture of how that either randomness, uniform distribution, or clumped set of samples can impact and accordingly perform irrespective of how good and how robust an AI or machine learning algorithm may be. So having said that, and definitely I'm extremely grateful to Parth Majumdar's also a statement or he he emphasizing how on which kind of topics the, the India genome projects have taken off and it and he did focus only on the human genome and also keep bringing the the queries or questions that were at the center uh, is, is still and now if i could uh, refer to his two um, projects that he stated one for cancer and maybe specifically to breast cancer oral cancer and etc so what happens is irrespective of the sample size uh, the samples collected have been for the affected uh, um, uh, people, right? The the uh, the patients, the if it is affect, affected people. So the here is the data of a kind. Now in AI, we also we have uh, this this entire area called learning and uh, nano machine learning, but learning from examples. So here, what when the sequencing is done, I don't know the details of that. But then all the attributes or what is visible in the sequence may be able to be correlated with the kind of disease or kind of manifestation of and variety of various things that are a concern that need to be addressed medically. But how about the negative example of the not if effective? Now, having said that, so if we have the, if we have one set and not the other, it is dif difficult then to differentiate and therefore like you no know, in machine learning either things are generalized or discriminated now we have so so therefore do we have the negative data if we say that if affected data is there data or of affected people is there then do we have the healthy people's data it may be but then if yes then uh, is it equal so is there, what is the kind of distribution you see? So uniform distribution, uh, no, no, uh, yeah. Okay, uniform distribution or unequal. And therefore, so so the representation, under-representation or biasness in the data does matter a lot. And it does, so therefore it does impact also if machine learning techniques are applied and algorithms are applied apart from the the you know the the preparation of data and so on and so forth um so now as having said that i was i mean i'm sure some of us those of us in india would have seen some of the, the web series and i was uh, i bumped into uh, the the prime web series called pocha and I recently watched the, the, the Netflix uh, series um, uh, Kalapani. And I think some of the, uh, I, I saw some of my dialogues also come about there from my engagement in matters which are, relate to, um, uh, let's say, the at least indigenous knowledge systems or tribal knowledge systems. Um, and as having said that, now, um, I, I I am, and I'm sure some of us are aware, although some of the um, uh, provisions uh, for collecting data may be uh, fulfilled as, if, as far as paperwork is, but then um, suppose the good, the sample of um, healthy people is also not as, uh, a, you know, uh, uniformly distributed over the space then the, the 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 quality of data itself is impacted and now in doing so and let's assume um you see if from the from uh, from the area from where the data has been received, definitely we would know, I mean, as uh, Prasama Jimdar was also mentioning, as to, um, uh, you know, um, to, I was trying to note it down. Um, but then, uh, the, the, yeah, to quantify the diversity, okay? 
And if the, 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 the diversity of data is not visible in one, one lot and not on the other, then the contrasting is uh, the, what we uh, uh, what uh, is extracted or what is learned from or, um, uh, or inferred may not be uh, to, totally unbiased. So uh, that is one. Second is that in the light of a quest for, especially now, the traditional um, uh, traditional knowledge being the focus to learn about some of the unknowns. So some of the no so here is uh, some knowns. And then there is also an attempt to um, uh, also go for the unknowns. And in so doing, now, if there aren't, like Prasadhar was also mentioning, like you know, some of uh, these ethical questions are self-regulated. If it occurs to the scientists that the scientists would put up one's guards for oneself, but then there aren't regulations. And so in the absence of such regulations, uh, there is no question of violation. But then I think, um, therefore, worldwide, this uh, term data sovereignty has come about. And especially in, the, uh, in case of specific people groups, it doesn't have to be only the tribal, but specific people's groups. I think uh, that if the data sovereignty principles be, um, be applied, I think it would be a fair thing to do. Now, um, th th there are two models that have that we I, we find in the literature about uh, you know the data principles. One is fair, which I think um, either Pragya mentioned or even Momita about uh, you know, the findable, accessible, uh, interoperable, and reusable. I think um, th this fair fair model doesn't re uh, address much the principles or the, or the values that we may like to club as ethical values. But on the other hand, uh, I think the care principles are a little more sensitive and which, may, which elaborates the care, C-A-R-E, is collective, collective uh, benefit, um, authority to control, so governance or control and governance, responsibility, which can also take care of the data, let's say the security, privacy, even in case of data breach, and even if it is a controlled sharing and ethics, of course. Um, and I, I think ethics worldwide doesn't change from country to country, religion to religion, and even community to community. Yeah. Um, uh, and so um, having said that, if the community, um, I, I see that the, the two web series I um, refer to, I think it very clearly brings out the, 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 the aspect of the symbiotic relation mainly indigenous and tribal people have had with nature that has not been understood well enough. And therefore, uh, the, 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 let's say the quest or even greed when comes into picture, uh, the, 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 the parts of the nature are exploited and even uh, they're taking advantage or disadvantage of the, the, the simple people. And uh, so uh, uh, therefore, I think whenever here, I, I would go with more with the care model, care data principles, but then it needs to be very, very well informed. And the person, let's say even the affected person to, to give a consent for the kind of research one would be in if does not really understand very well and I will get well, maybe my this this will uh, contribute to my treatment. And if that is how it has been explained and not treatment of all, and you know, this is only an exploratory. So I think that session of, you know, getting the consent, the processes of consent doesn't have to be only with the person, but the family, 
maybe somebody else also who understands. And so that it is done with dignity of the person. Okay, so that uh, the human dignity be also considered as a principle while the processes are taken up in order to uh, even, um, uh, you know, implement and um, uh, and uh, because I, I think all of us are equally curious and human mind is such. Curiosity keeps us going more than anything else also. And therefore, in order to uh, satisfy the curious brains that we possess, um, uh, if the, 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 the values that can help good, beneficial, uh, and uh, uh, a collective benefit uh, uh, good good that that results into collective benefit these are if and then with equal dignity not only of the researcher alone but but the person uh, from whom the data may be collected if that e dignity of equal uh, no, equality of dignity is preserved i think we can take the next step but but i think as it was said in the absence of such regulatory uh, uh, norms it is difficult and I think worldwide, uh, in other countries, especially Canada and the United States, they they are working on um, uh, uh, some of these data sovereignty um, uh, documents, so that uh, so that the, the the areas, the geographical areas, which was earlier occupied by indigenous populations, um, uh, 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 these these uh, data sovereignty um, uh, uh, governance. Um, uh, 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 tools are going to be put in place. Um, uh, uh, they, that's the desire. And I hope we all can learn from them too. And uh, so I t uh, bridging between the one end of AI and the, the indigenous rights, the other, uh, uh, try to do justice with time also. And thank you very much for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you, Professor Mitch, for uh, such a wonderful highlights. And of course, uh, also highlighting the care principles, because I think in India, we now need to very much careful about when we do some research, we should not be exploiting. So in that regards, I think it's very important that we really now highlight the care principle here. Uh, but without now uh, taking much time, I will hand it over to Pragya, because I'm sure there are a lot of questions in everyone's mind. Pragya, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mumita, for the, taking care of the panel discussion. And thank you so much to all our panelists for bringing this varied and diverse, uh, you know, perspectives, right, from what is happening in the human genomics in India to what is happening in synthetic genomics and to how AI is actually affecting the entire equation and what is required uh, when we are talking about indigenous data rights and oh my, they like there are some electricity problems at my end but anyway not letting it affect the conversation um so firstly to the audience if you have any questions right now is the time you, that you can place it in the chat and we will you know take it up during the conversation but currently i'm going to open the floor for this uh, discussion and getting into the conversation a bit further so firstly, thank you to Dr. Mintz for talking about the care principles and uh, also saying that like we need to go beyond the informed consent and uh, data when we are talking about data privacy. Because as Professor Path had mentioned, there have been, uh, we do not have such examples within India as of yet where genomics data has been used for marginalization. But there have been examples globally where genomic data and such kind of work has been uh, has caused some sort of community harm. And that was done totally unintentionally. So when we are discussing about these kind of aspects like community harm or how do we be, make it more inclusive, what according to each of you, you know what we can do to include the communities and the indigenous people directly in the conversation because even uh, when i'm talking about professor dhara talked about gene editing we do not know yet how it is going to unfold in india when it finally arrives over here so uh, just a, just a broader question to you how do we address the inclusivity question how do we 
address how do we do these kind of monitoring assess assessment that uh, nobody's uh, you know even unintentionally marginalized we are not doing any unintentional community harms given the structure of indian population is such so i would like to start with professor path so that's a good question and it, there's no uh, simple solution to this uh, and there's not even a unique solution to this. Not only that, that it is not simple, there's no unique solution to this. Just depends on the uh, context where you are and context can mean language, geography, culture, everything. I'm not uh, attending to, uh, attempting to defocus the issue. The issue is that, uh, you know, how do you not uh, marginalize people using these kinds of data? Well, to, according to me, the first thing that you do is uh, that uh, when you are undertaking a project in a particular community, you need to engage with the community. You just can't descend on the community and say that, you know, I'm going to uh, take, take your consent to get a sample of blood and collect some relevant data from you and go and analyze that. So doesn't happen today. I mean, most most uh, communities will not even allow that. So the, the, the most important is to be able to engage with the community prior to collecting even one single sample. Uh, when you uh, engage with the community, you explain to them what the purpose of your research is. Uh, you have to be patient and you have to take multiple days explaining to multiple subsections of the community about the purpose of the project. Then, of course, you get there, uh, uh, you know, you, you, they start to cooperate with you. You get uh, informed consent and, uh, again, informed consent. Um, uh, one, one form of informed consent is uh, from the individual. Of course, it's the individual who is uh, going to provide you with data and sample is the person who is uh, providing you with consent. Now, there are two points of view. One point we've just, uh, one point of view we have just heard which is from uh, Professor Minz uh, saying that the informed consent should not be taken from the individual in isolation, but should be taken in the presence of members of the community. That's uh, one approach. The Western approach is exactly the opposite, um, which is that, uh, you know, the informed consent is a private consent that's being provided and therefore um, it should be taken only from that individual in the absence of uh, any other individual's while the consenting procedure is going on. I see merit in both in the sense that, let me take the Western point of view, so, uh, and I've also seen this happen in my own field work uh, in India when I have gone to uh, collect blood samples from various communities. Uh, the, um, uh, when you are actually trying to get informed consent from a particular person in the presence of other persons of that community, there is an irrelevant pressure that's created on this individual. Uh, the pressure can go either way. The individual does not want to uh, cooperate with you, does not want to um, uh, you know, provide you with a sample, and uh, the other members of the community will create some kind of a pressure such that this individual is forced to give you a sample. It can go the other way around as well. So that's uh, uh, one. The other is, like Professor Min said, that once we are in during the informed consent procedure, if we are engaging a, a number of members of the community, then it actually provides to other members of the community also what we are doing. I think I would take the position that the informed consent should be taken only from that individual, but the community should be engaged. We should engage with the community before we implement the project in the community. By implementing the project, I mean collecting data and uh, blood samples for the kind of work that I do or for genomics work. So this is my take on this. And once we do, so that's the first phase. The second phase and the third phases are very simple, which is during the conduct of the project, you need to keep uh, engaging with them. And this engagement actually helps them understand. They are not going to understand the details of your genomic uh, assays and whatever else you're doing, but at least they are, uh, they are, they, they are assured that you have not taken their samples and gone away, that you are actually engaging with them. The third part is the most important. What is, after you have collected the samples, analyzed the samples and so on, what have been the inferences? And for uh, people like me who have uh, spent most of their uh, time looking at you know, relationships among communities, uh, uh, looking at diversity, et cetera, 
go back to the community and explain to them what the implications of the analysis are. And that itself is, I think, uh, a good ethical approach to all of this. Right now, uh, like I was introduced by Momita saying that, you know, I'm on an international committee of what's called the Human Cell Atlas. The Human Cell Atlas, has, as a matter of fact, has enshrined this as the, uh, the, the modicum of doing um, any project under the rubric of Human Cell Atlas, that you need to engage at these three levels. Human Cell Atlas has gone one step forward, that if members of the community want to be trained by you in the details of the project, please engage with them and provide them with the training. So this is, this is, the, uh, this is the way that we think, or this is the way that uh, you know, many of us think is the best way to uh, go about uh, uh, taking taking consent and uh, getting indigenous communities to your side, uh, such that the level of ostracization or marginalization using these data will be minimized because then the indigenous communities are going to speak up because now they have an understanding of what happens to the data or what happens with the data. Thank you. Just a quick follow-up to that, Professor, but because we know the Genome India project has just, it's in the phase one uh, stage, but soon it will be growing bigger and it will be going to the communities. Are there any protocols, such protocols, as you have mentioned, are already in place for the Genome India project? So um, in terms of uh, explain, explaining to the community, uh, well, I can't, I can't give you a, complete overview of this i have been associated with some of the groups that are you know it's a it's a consortium of multiple groups from various parts of india who are collecting samples etc there is no written i wish that it was there there is no written uh, framework as to how data collection or sample collection needs to be done unfortunately all of this happened during the covid times and so uh, there was uh, much less uh, much less interaction among the various groups uh, but having said that, I'm associated with some of the groups. Some of the groups are doing uh, exactly what I said, which or have done exactly what I said, which is that they have engaged with the community ahead of time uh, before they actually, uh, you know, stuck a needle into the vein of an individual. So they have spent time. I don't know whether all of the groups have done it. Um, so this this has been done. The the data generation and analysis are going on right now. Um, as as I uh, know um, almost firsthand that during this time, uh, people who have collected uh, data from communities are actually not uh, continuing to engage with the communities. I wish they did. Again, there are uh, issues here, issues of time, issues of money, because you need money to be able to keep engaging with the communities from whom you have um, you know, collect and who pays for those uh, trips that you additional trips that you need to undertake. And I wish that this was, it was all you know sort of uh, uh, written up ahead of time, such that this money would also be provided by the Department of Biotechnology. Uh, I'm hoping that finally, after the analysis is done, each of these uh, individuals or uh, you know project leaders will actually go back to the communities and provide to them the summary of the results that uh, have been obtained. In these, uh, in this particular project, I am not. I'm not very sure, but uh, uh, at least the first part has been has been done by some communities, uh, by some um, uh, research. Um, uh, um, you know, uh, people who are participating in this kind of research. Yeah. Thank you so much, Professor Pat. Uh, Dr. Vince, I know you are also a community-based participatory research uh, person mentor and so you have a lot of knowledge on how to directly work with communities so when we are talking discussing specifically about indigenous data sovereignty how do you think like what how we can go about it what could be you know as professor path was suggesting multiple methods to uh, you know be more inclusive what is your take on it um, well, uh, I think uh, Professor Majumdar has absolutely uh, put it very nicely, um, covered all the components uh, that I had in mind. So I am not able to add a lot more to that. Um, I would like to highlight just one point um, from what he said. Um, when you know uh, you collect the data from people and uh, give them some view of how this is going to be used. 
um, you see, when we say informed consent, it makes sense only when people are educated. If they do not know what is informed consent, if they do not know anything about uh, the applications of this data, most of the times they will agree, uh, this is not about uh, one particular country, this is globally. Uh, they would agree if there are economic benefits attached to the data. They do not see really beyond that because for them survival is more important than evolution. So uh, I think it's very important uh, uh, and also big responsibility for, for all of us to educate people, first of all, and uh, give them all aspects of this uh, you know, knowledge. Uh, and then we can talk of benefit sharing agreements and we can talk of uh, you know, the other aspects that might be interesting for, from their perspective, or maybe in future, if, we, if you train them enough, they can analyze their own data. Uh, maybe in future, if if uh, you know we we build the capacity and empower them, rather than taking the data from them and then analyzing in the labs, uh, why not empower them to analyze their own data? Uh, well, a lot of these things make sense uh, only when the uh, intellectual level is high; they are trained properly. Uh, so a lot of effort needs to be put in training people, and then to me. Um, everything else will fall into place. Otherwise, many a times, um, there are short-term aspects related to the data collection uh, with good intent, of course. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not talking about anything wrong here, but um, uh, it would make sense if, if they are uh, trained properly. So th that, uh, to me, is an, uh, a slight add-on feature to what Professor Majinder already said very nicely. Um, I basically agree with everything he said here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Professor Mintz, your take on this. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Now, uh, as in the beginning when I was speaking, uh, this need not be what uh, what I was trying to say is also doesn't have to be only with indigenous or tribal communities in India, but it can be, as Professor uh, uh, Majumdar had mentioned, any endogamic uh, uh, you know, community. That is one. Two, what Prasadha just mentioned, when the data collection is done, does the person who is supposed to give out data understand totally? So it is about language again, you know, the language that the person understands. And uh, the, the, the third aspect is, of course, like, you know, this entire um, uh, consent, the process of consent need not be, you know, one sitting and, uh, you know, sign the paper. No. As Professor Majumdar was mentioning, there can be phases of how the various things are explained. So, so far as listening, everybody gets educated about it, you know, entire uh, thing. And then to assume that somebody where, who is being spoken to would not understand which is in the mind of the very, I mean, a high level science, uh, scientist researcher, I think that's again, uh, the, the bias, that's the bias, because I think whenever, um, especially now, let me come uh, go back to go to the, the, the domain of the uh, tribal or indigenous communities. And as, as I had mentioned, you know, the symbiotic relation they have with the entire, you know, ecosystem. That's never well understood enough. I think uh, I'm not, uh, they've not given me any <laughs> incentive to advertise, but Pocha, if you no know, Pocha, this web series is watched as well as Kalapani, it will become very clear as to what I'm talking about. Because the elephants, it's about, the, the, and the, how the forest is cared by the elephants, not humans. Okay, that, that's one element that was that had come out. So the, my point is that the wisdom doesn't mean only scientific wisdom with a, which a, reserve, a research uh, a scientist who is embark, embarking on a research, or, uh, you know, and to, to find would only be there. I mean, unless they sit down and talk and then find the deadlocks, I think it cannot be proved that the other person would not understand. And having said that, therefore, these days, when even the line of treatment to anybody, the entire plan or line of treatment is discussed with the entire family. That is how like, you know, the big treatments are. 
why not for you know collecting data okay i'm just pitching this these these two procedures parallel okay number one having said that now in the, the, the scope of data sovereignty especially with the indigenous uh, peoples and which i have learned from the american indigenous communities as well as Can canada is it's the, the ownership of data, the storage of data would lie with them. So they would own the data. Okay, collection happens. Then finally, data ownership would be with them. That So that's about storage. Two is about control. So they can decide to give. Okay. And then uh, uh, that is uh, two. And third, the autonomy. Again, like, you know, if it is to be given part of it, whatever. So... And the fourth, which Prasadhar was also mentioning, like, you know, what comes out and Professor Majumdar also mentioned, it need not be economic all the time, but it is innovation and it is invention. Are they, will, will if it is a community, then now, will they be considered as partners and equal partners in that research? You know, although the hard work is done, lab work is done, but where did the data come from? So these are some of the elements that are being deliberated uh, under the scope of data sovereignty. And unless we deliberate again, again, uh, you know, with the, the likes of Professor Majumdar, Professor Dhar and others, and, you know, and those uh, who, who, who are very strong about uh, data sovereignty, especially in from the perspective of indigenous communities, and a person like me who stands in between at least intersection of two areas, I think unless we deliberate, I think we it will be difficult to proceed in a fair fair manner, not not the fair principle, but you no know, with a fairness in the heart, yes, for common benefit. Thank you, thank you so much to all the panelists for a very comprehensive answer. And I think we have a few questions in the uh, chat box as well. First one is from Angela Page. Angela, would you like to unmute yourself and uh, ask this, your question? Sure, thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Angela Page. I'm Director of Strategy and Engagement from the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, which uh, explains where my question is coming from. Are there Indian human genomics projects participating in international data sharing and or standards discussions, international standards discussions? What has been the experience and how can the international community do a better job of supporting that participation? Thank you. Professor Park, I take this like question. I take this question from Angela. Um, the answer to your question is yes. Uh, I have given uh, examples of some international projects. So, for example, in the International Cancer Genome Consortium, uh, we participated with oral cancer as our mainstay. We generated uh, 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 genomic data on 500 patients. Uh, well, not just patients, but uh, you know, from the tumor tissue and adjacent normal tissue. Uh, all of these data are in the international repository of the International Cancer Genome Consortium Project. So we've shared that data, and the, the data sharing was uh, a part of this uh, deal that we became a part of the uh, International Cancer Genome Consortium. The second is Genome India Project. The Genome India, I'm sorry, not the Genome India Project, I mean Genome Asia Project. Uh, the Genome Asia Project generated data on um, over 3,000 genomes um, with 500 from uh, 500, well, about 600 from India, and all of these data are in an international repository uh, accessible. Um, it's uh, a little regulated because uh, in the sense that one needs to explain the purpose of, um, uh, you know, uh, getting access to that data, but it's uh, kind of loose. So as soon as you explain the purpose, you are given access. So the answer, I can give more examples, but that's not the um, important issue. The important issue is that, yes, India has and is participating in international projects uh, and data sharing is an important component of those projects. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angela, for that question. Based on that question, one other like question that we that has when we were actually even thinking about this entire panel, Momita and I had been thinking that when we uh, since you talk about genome Asia and Map Asia, how does data sharing works across the borders? And I mean, we know that open data sharing is an important component of the all these you know projects, as you said, that this data belongs to everyone. Yet there is a national, uh, you know, part of keeping the data within the borders and 
how it helps nationally. So how do we balance that kind of dynamics uh, when we are discussing about genomics data? So uh, Professor Path, I would like to have you first and then Professor yes. Dhar, I would like to Sure, I mean, I, uh, India has an open data sharing policy. Uh, it's not true that India's uh, data need to be, uh, you know, with concentrated within the national boundaries. Uh, if you, it's it's actually a bill that's been passed in the Indian Parliament about open data sharing policy. It's available, uh, you know, on the internet openly. Uh, the only uh, point that I would like to make is that the data that will be shared will be stripped of all personal identifiers, and that's only, uh, uh, you know, that's desirable. And so all of these data will be stripped of all personal identifiers. Um, when we uh, submit data to an international database, uh, it's expected that uh, we will also simultaneously or prior submit that data to an Indian database such that it's, uh, uh, you know, in case of um, regulations that will... Uh, uh, disallow access to the international database for Indian scientists. At least we have the data that were generated in India available in an Indian database. So India does support an open data sharing policy. And don't take my word for it. Just type it out on Google and you'll get the document. That's that's brilliant to know. Uh, Professor Dhar, please. Uh... Please uh, comment. Like, what is the take? What is happening? What when we are discuss thinking about in terms of synthetic biology? What is the uh, is that escape over there? Thank you, Pragya. Uh, <clears throat> so, synthetic biology. Um, uh, it has been more than ten years that people have individually been pursuing this um, new area. Um, so we have, uh, from the data sharing and from the regulation point of view, I will not talk about the science and technology here because that's not relevant. Um, from the uh, regulation point of view, uh, we did uh, the first foresight study nearly three years back. Uh, this was the first India's uh, foresight study in synthetic biology. It was uh, commissioned by Department of Biotechnology. Uh, so Ministry of Science and Technology, Government of India. And uh, we made some recommendations regarding uh, the uh, plugins that are required given the emergence of uh, new aspects uh, that need close attention. So uh, the intent was to build a, a certain framework on the basis of which then uh, stakeholders, both from government and private industry and academia, everyone will come together and uh, then uh, broad-based policy would be created. Uh, government is sensitive to that. Um, they have uh, discussed with us many times. So I think uh, we are wanting to uh, expand it uh, to the core level so that uh, more discussions can take place and uh, there will be input from uh, different countries. Uh, there are aspects which uh, need attention. Uh, for example, uh, currently the long DNA synthesis of the DNA data. You know, one is, of course, collecting the data that's available there. And second is synthesizing DNA. That's another level of data. Um, well, uh, currently, there are companies that are sharing with each other. Say, for example, if somebody wants to uh, synthesize uh, the DNA sequence of a deadly virus, uh, what are the regulations around that? These are the global issues. This has nothing to do with one specific country. Uh, and so there needs to be some plug in there. Uh, people are sharing this um, among uh, the DNA synthesis companies. They are sharing this data to make sure that nothing nasty happens. Uh, that's, of course, one aspect uh, which needs uh, certain attention. And second is um, what kind of research needs to be pursued. Uh, there are people who are in favor of bringing back, uh, there's a big woolly mammoth project going on in the US. Uh, we want to bring, we are missing dinosaurs. So, uh, well, do we really need them? Uh, uh, that's another aspect because um, ecosystems are gone. Their, uh, their diet is no longer available, uh, whatever they used to eat. So what are they going to eat? And is this sensible? Is this responsible project? Uh, so we need to have a view on that collectively as a community. 
uh, designing uh, brand new microbes or uh, installing codes into the DNA and uh, installing certain new functionalities. Uh, there have been, the, the entire platform is very robust when it comes to the regulation aspect of the biotechnology. But here we are talking of uh, DNA uh, that is made in the lab, the codes that are made in the lab that do not have any natural equivalent. So we need some attention on that. I'm saying again, globally. Um, of course, uh, we have always been open to more discussions and uh, we have been discussing with our uh, US counterparts. Uh, a lot of discussions are going on, biosecurity aspects, uh, especially. Uh, and uh, so a, a lot more needs to be, uh, you know, uh, brought in the discussion forum and uh, we need to have some common uh, uh, sort of um, overview about how we are going to take things forward. Uh, so action plans needed. Yes. So I'm just actually curious uh, because you, since you brought about biosecurity and all those things in the picture. So when we are discussing about cross border data sharing, there is also an element of you know, of biosecurity and national data security and those things. But yet we kind of agree that open data sharing is an important aspect. So, I mean, how do you keep that balance? Like what what needs to be, strat what, as we say, like what needs to be strategically open? What do we, how do we go about this entire uh, exercise? Yeah, it's a very difficult question. It's a very difficult question. I can give an intellectual answer to this, but end of the day, is that useful or not? I think that is uh, very important. Uh, we have been discussing this not only here, but uh, uh, previously uh, with the US National Academy of Sciences, with Beijing Academy of Sciences, uh, we had a lot of discussion. Uh, however, uh, when it comes to implementation, then every country has their own way of uh, looking at things, their own national interests. So definitions do get diluted. And uh, ethics, again, there is no universal definition to that. However, uh, whatever is uh, possible within our limited means, we need to stick to that. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a difficult um, question as to how much do you share because if there is any commercial aspect linked to this and then you want to be open, uh, do you want to share it or not? Um, yeah, I think we need more discussion. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, when we are talking about natural genomes, we are, there's already a complication of who does this belong to. And then we are adding another layer of synthetic genomes. And it's an entire Pandora's box, like whether it should, whether it belongs to a country, whether it belongs to a person, whether it belongs to a researcher, where does it go? And talking about this, I mean, uh, Prof. Dr. Anub Das has asked a very, uh, you know, question, which is a great uh, question in this perspective. Uh, Dr. Anub Das, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is related to regulatory framework. Is there any regulatory framework available for genomic data governance in India? And I have another question related to uh, Digital Data Protection Act, which was passed in 2023. Uh, is there any link to uh, genomic data in that act? So that is my question. Thank you. So, Dr. Anu's first question is basically about the uh, available regulatory frameworks which govern the genomic data. Yes. Uh, Professor Path, would you like to take this question first? Is, is that for data sharing? Is that uh, the regulatory framework for data sharing? Uh, data handling? Data handling, data processing? Uh, data handling, data processing, uh, I don't know what, uh, because it's very uh, dependent on the project that you're handling. It's uh, The regulatory framework is essentially at the level of data sharing, because that's where there are touchy issues. Uh, in terms of the national uh, data sharing policy, if you look at it, the one that I referred to a few minutes ago, uh, essentially it says, that it, it's very open, it essentially says that anything that is non-sensitive can be shared. Now, there is a catch to this, and we have tried to elicit uh, information from agencies 
who decides what is non-sensitive data? This is a big question mark uh, because you know all data can be uh, you know data sharing of sharing of all data can be stopped by saying that anything that you want to share is sensitive data hasn't happened so far. Uh, we are not so at least the country is not so cagey about this, and we have shared various kinds of data both in um, at the population uh, you know normal pop individual level for population genetic studies as also for uh, disease related studies but there is this clause that uh, what you can share is only non sensitive data hasn't been very clearly uh, defined in the document and that's one major issue it, the, so uh, the regulatory framework that is there in terms of data sharing is all enshrined in this uh, uh, national data sharing policy uh, that that was approved in by the parliament i think in 2012 uh, and uh, based on that, these uh, the Interna uh, Indian Biological Data Center actually follows that document and has elaborated on some of the articles of that particular document. So I would say that in terms of the analysis, etc., the only uh, point that that uh, is uh, that all of us self-regulate is not to uh, handle or to handle um, uh, you know these uh, private data. Uh, in a in a with a with a in a in a proper way by proper way I mean that you don't divulge that data you don't share this uh, data with your colleagues even when the analysis is going on so uh, the privacy needs to be appropriately uh, protected of the individuals who are participants in your project. Thank you so much, Professor Park. Uh, Professor Bhar, would you like to comment? No, no, I think essentially I totally agree with Professor Majun. There is an authority on this. So I completely no, but agree. I just want to uh, ask because initially you had mentioned that there are already some regulatory bodies in biotechnology. So one of the questions that Professor uh, Dr. Anup had put in the questions is uh, who are these uh, regulatory actors? Can you just quickly run us through that? Yeah, of course, we have, uh, you know, start with uh, there is um, the Institutional Biosafety Committee. Um, you cannot submit a project or you cannot uh, work on anything till this institutional biosafety committee clears the project. And they look at every aspect of the work that you're doing with respect to the DNA modification. Um, uh, so, uh, or even synthesizing DNA, you know, they, they all take care of this. And there's a department of biotechnology representative sitting on these committees all the time. So, um, and then from there, the entire story moves to DBT. And so there's another level of committee. Um, and there is a recombinant advisory panel. They, they take care of whatever uh, recommendations are from this uh, IBSC panel. Then there is another higher level of committee. And again, a genetic engineering level. So uh, at least three different levels uh, that I'm aware of. Um, they take care of you know whatever has been, let's say, accidentally missed by somebody, so there are plugins, uh, of course, uh, make sure that. So funding cannot take place unless you address all the queries. And these are, these are practicing scientists. These are not like just administrators. They are practicing scientists who are on the bench and they know what's going on. So uh, we're pretty much covered from that. Uh, okay. When you talk of the emerging technologies, uh, I, was, I was pointing to that. Um, we need a lot more discussion. Uh, of course, uh, we have come to the level where uh, genome editing has been incorporated in the first level uh, that, okay, you can do this much and not really more than that, and you have to justify that. Um, but when it comes to the other aspects that are evolving, uh, we are now seeing the, the uh, integration of um, AI in, in biotechnology or, or recombinant DNA technology. Uh, very soon we are going to see quantum computing coming in a big way. And they're already claiming that you don't need to do experiments. You know, we will do all the experiments for you in the computer, so don't worry. <laughs> so we don't know what's going on and uh, uh, what kind of, you know, we may have to have these discussions again after a year or two because the technology is moving very fast. So, yeah. That's true. Right here, can, I, can, I, can I just add one, uh, one, yeah. one small little... Um, point to what you asked. Um, so uh, there is still uh, a committee in the Indian Council of Medical Research that actually um, oversees 
and regulates all of the international collaborations that we do. Uh, this is, uh, um, uh, you know, in the Ministry of Health. So, and I'm only talking about biology-oriented projects that are that deal with humans, whether it is health, whether it is, uh, you know, just population genetics. All of this is uh, actually done by this committee or actually goes through uh, uh, this particular committee. They monitor it. Um, prior to 2012, it wasn't clear to those of us who, uh, you know, uh, engage in international projects whether this committee also needs to be told or this committee will regulate how the data are going to be shared. That was always a confusion. After 2012, when the, uh, open, the, when the data sharing policy has been uh, clearly enunciated by the gov government of India, uh, the, that committee which still functions and we still need to submit all the paperwork to that committee if you're dealing with humans, uh, they don't really look at the uh, you know data sharing part. They only look at by specimen sharing part and by specimen sharing there are clear regulations as to what you can and what you cannot share um also want to add one more sentence to what angela had asked and this is mo much more recent so india is not india some of us in, uh, are also participating in the human cell atlas uh, which is essentially single cell genomics of various kinds of tissues uh, we have been working on, again, things the genomics of oral cancer, and we have uh, our data have been generated, and these are now in uh, the Human Cell Atlas, uh, you know, the international database. So um, and these these kinds of data sharing uh, with, without any personal identifier is happening from India at the international level. Thank you. Okay, so... Since we have very limited time, I'm going to ask one question to all three of you or to all three of the panelists. And that question is, currently at this very moment today, what are the key priorities and action points that need to be addressed to advance responsible genomic data governance and innovation in India over the next decade? And uh, Dr. Mintz, would you like to initiate this conversation? I just need few points from you and yeah, yeah now uh, i would try to play the role of a data scientist and uh, therefore to say uh, that the data that is let's say i mean you know, ethically acquired all the clearances are done after that to ensure the security no breach right kind of ownership sovereignty and governance all be in place because I think this uh, this area also ought to evolve so that, uh, you know, at every, any given point in time, let's say one of the donors, I mean, who from whom the sample has been considered, if pulls out of it or decides to pull out of it, uh, that option, things like that, those options be also there besides just the database questions. So, yeah. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mills. Uh, Professor Dhar, would you like to, what's your take on this? Would you like to comment? <laughs> yeah, I think um, essentially um, we need to talk more and we need to meet continuously. Uh, when I say we, I'm talking about the stakeholders uh, who are involved in this. Um, otherwise, you know, you start uh, creating a certain uh, framework in mind and you start assuming that this is reality. So uh, to make sure that we stay within the responsible innovation zone, uh, there's a need to have more dialogue uh, among different uh, stakeholders. It would be great to have an open science kind of movement or let's say biodiversity commons, wherein people uh, are not afraid to talk, afraid to share. Of course, they can still retain um, the intellectual property, um, but we can, um, in the spirit of open science uh, that the world needs, I think we need to, um, uh, think about how do you uh, generate the data, reuse, distribute the data, uh, or reproduce this in a certain standardized form and so on. Uh, uh, to cut the long story short because of the, the time span, um, I would say there is, there is a need to have a regular dialogue. Thank you, Professor Dhar. Uh, Professor Dhar, would you like to please weigh in? Well, in terms of uh, governance, uh, essentially, of genomics data, the one thing that really bothers me and, and uh, bothers me because we haven't started thinking about it very seriously 
is the issue of application of um, artificial intelligence on these kinds of data, especially for the point of view of uh, either diagnosis or prognosis of various kinds of diseases. And the reason why I'm very concerned is that there are, um, well, there are at two levels. One is at the instrumentation level. Uh, there are uh, companies that are selling us AI-based instruments. Many of you may actually been wearing, um, be wearing those instruments, but never mind. The other is a set of algorithms that is that takes in genomics data and other kinds of data, imaging data, genomics data, and in a, and tries to build a, an integrative uh, prediction of diagnosis or prognosis of diseases. The major ethical issue here is that these uh, algorithms have been trained on data sets that come from other countries, whether those data sets the inferences from those data sets or the algorithms can actually be applicable to populations in India is not even tested. The uh, software is purchased by hospitals and other such uh, you know, institutions and are used. Now, the ethical issues arise from two levels. One is that this is an algorithm that hasn't even been tested in our population. And therefore, the ethical major ethical issue is that is it actually providing proper guidance to us? We are not even talking about this, uh, and we need to talk about this. Fortunately, the World Health Organization, again, I'm very happy to share with you the fact that, you know, I co-chaired two reports. The World Health Organization has actually come up with two major reports on um, uh, ethical uh, guidance for uh, artificial intelligence in health, uh, in the context of health. I forget the exact title of these reports. But anyway, we in India should start thinking about this. Unless we think about this, think about the ethical issues and the impact of these uh, uh, uses of artificial intelligence that have been trained on uh, non-Indian data, we can't even think about governance. So the dialogue needs to start, the discussion needs to start as to what the implications of, uh, you know, blindfold uh, implementation of these AI algorithms in India can lead to, if it if we don't start discussing that, we cannot build governance models for uh, these. That That's one of my biggest, uh, chat, you know, worries, concerns right now, because these are integrative algorithms that integrate genomics data, epigenomics data, uh, imaging data, and so on and so forth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Professor Path. I mean, for bringing up a very pertinent question. And this is something that, I mean, we would like to keep this con conversation, keep this dialogue flowing. I hope this is like just one of the first of such discussions and in future we can all get together and deliberate further on uh, on these uh, points that you have raised. And, but with this, I see that uh, our time has come to a close. So I will just quickly do a word of thanks uh, firstly, it's to Research Data Alliance, to Elena and Connie and everybody from Research Data Alliance team who has been very gracious in giving us this platform and very supportive and helpful throughout our journey. And then also to the UNESCO chairs and to DSTCPR IISC for being very supportive of this entire event. And obviously to our panelists, uh, Professor Mintz for always being very supportive of what we do and being the voice of reason and the indigenous, uh, you know, supporter, like the voice of, flag bearer of the indigenous voices for us. And yes, thank you so much for that, Professor Mintz. We really love you for that. And we really, uh, you know, hope that you continue supporting us. And to Professor Dhar, thank you so much. We know that it was very short. Uh, you know, we did not, we were not able to manage to reach you on time. And it was very short notice for you. And yet you were here with us and you shared your insights with us. We are very grateful for that. Uh, and to Professor Paz Majumda, so I would let everyone know over here that this entire conversation is happening because it was Professor Path who had initiated this discussion, this dialogue with me. And this is an outcome of that meeting. This is an outcome of that dialogue. So Professor Path, thank you for being this guiding light. Uh, and uh, thank you for supporting. And hopefully you will keep on supporting us uh, in our journey in this quest. 
and then to all the participants, all the people who have joined us and have been here till the end of this entire uh, session. Thank you so much for joining us today. And with this, I think I will uh, end the session. So thanks everyone. And